Well, it's 9 o'clock in the central time zone in uh, the United States. Welcome to all of our Canadian visitors. Uh, this in, this uh, webinar was intended to be a rerun of last week's webinar. We had some technical difficulties, so you're hearing it live. My name is Shirley Gutkowski, and I will be conducting the course today on xylitol and biofilm. You can't have one without the other. Career Fusion is a career college for clinicians who are interested in doing something else with their career. There comes a time in every clinician's um, in their it comes a time in every clinician's experience where they wonder what else can I be doing besides sitting chairside. Career Fusion is the answer to you for that question. We attract a lot of different kinds of people to career fusion. We've had extraordinary success building people's careers from everything from uh, just supercharging their clinical career to doing lunch and learns to doing webinars to writing articles. It's, uh, it's been a very pleasurable experience for Beth Thompson, Patty DeGange, and I. There's me. This is our 2009 class. You can see all of our smiling faces there. You can see some people you may even recognize, including Beth uh, right behind me there, and Patty is somewhere. There she is in the front. These are the kinds of people we attract to Career Fusion. Our next retreat is January 2009. You can get more information at careerfusion.net. That's www.careerfusion.net. Our primary goal is to bring people of like mind together, to bring new thoughts together, and shorten your learning curve. There's no reason why you should have to make the same mistakes that Patty, Beth, and I have made in our career path. So let's get started with xylitol and biofilm. You can't have one with the other. We'll start off with talking a little bit about biofilm. I have to tell you that this topic excites me to no end, and I might end up giggling happily sometime during this program. So let's talk a little bit about biofilm in general, and I want to bring this point home above all others because I continually make this mistake myself. A biofilm is a community of microbes. There are a lot of different inhabitants in that community, including bacteria. Mostly what we do is talk about a bacterial biofilm, bacterial biofilm, the, bio, the bacteria in the biofilm. But really, there is also yeast, there's also fungus, there's also virus, and little bits and parts of all of those things are in a biofilm as well. It's part of nature. It uh, occurs spontaneously in any fluid uh, fluid environment, even the pipeline, the, uh, the Alaskan pipeline that carries oil. So it doesn't necessarily need water. It can work, it can develop itself in any place where there's fluid movement, including the cravicular fluid. That's all the movement that it really needs. It can be anywhere from a few microns thick to several inches thick when you think about some of the biofilms that you see floating in a stream or a creek. This is a rendition of what a biofilm may look like. You can see that this one here is tall and purposefully it is directed to look this way. Within this biofilm mass, we see a bunch of different germs in there. We have some green germs, we have some tan germs, we have some some black microbes. We have these other little uh, little things that look like branches here. All of those are different inhabitants of the micro of the biofilm. And in order for them to choose what size or shape they will take on, they use a thing called quorum sensing. The quorum sensing is really a chemistry equation. These different microbes that live within a biofilm excrete certain chemicals that act as communicators to other bacteria and other microbes within the biofilm. When it's time to eliminate waste, they all get together and they start pumping out a certain chemical. 
If it's time to bring more water to the equation or more water to the biofilm, they start cranking out a different chemical. If it's time to grow, if it's time to shrink, if it's time to change shape, if there is a certain um, element in the environment that is caustic and they have to shut down, all of that is manhandled by something called quorum sensing. We have a number of micro colonies inside here as well as you can see like these little clumps of green microbes. We can also see that some of them are inside and some are outside and some are trying to get in. When we're looking at the continuum of a biofilm, we see here that we start with planktonic growth. Planktonic bacteria are those bacteria who live outside of the biofilm. See how this clump of green germs right here is surrounded in this little tan um, mucopolysaccharide. That is what keeps the biofilm healthy and safe. And we'd like to approach the biofilm, in medicine especially, over here in this area. But usually we come in over here once we see an infection or we have even a systemic kind of a problem showing up where inflammation is part of the equation. But really we would like to go right inside of this square right here. If you think about it for a minute, in dental hygiene we have always talked about brushing and flossing and as much as I don't like talking about brushing and flossing, that is where we are approaching the critical colonization point of a biofilm. Then we start with the localized infection, but we like to approach things right here. It takes up to three months to go to this line over here. So if we can approach these issues before three months, we would be doing our patients a huge service. This is what a biofilm is usually represented as with respect to a periodontal pocket. We have the soft tissue wall of the pocket right here, we have the hard tissue wall right here, and we have biofilms growing on the hard tissue wall of the pocket. You can see that there are some bacteria that are being kicked out of the biofilm, some that are being welcomed in. These holes here represent the waterways that bring nutrition to the biofilm and remove waste. You can see a big chunk has been liberated here and it's floating through, but it will attach and starts all over again. What's interesting about this picture though is the soft tissue wall of the pocket and how it looks so healthy. When really I have to wonder aloud if this is really true. We have a number of studies that I think we should be looking at more frequently when we're talking about periodontal infections and I think we're missing a lot of the boat by not not uh, really addressing this side of the pocket. What's happening in here between the hard and soft tissue wall is another gigantic chemistry equation. As the bacteria break down, as the waste products start to accumulate, all of that is again chemistry. Part of what's happened, part of those chemicals are what we, what we as a host are producing to try to get rid of the bacteria, including histamines, C-reactive proteins, and um, volatile sulfur compounds. We used to talk about volatile sulfur compounds quite a bit, I don't know, five or six years ago. It's starting to come back into the discussion again because those three in particular create a porosity right here in this soft tissue wall. So this is not sound, it's not like, I don't know, it's not fixed like it is right here in this picture. It is wide open. And the reason, the part of the reason why it needs to be wide open is because we need to get the white blood cells in and out of the tissue to address the bacteria, which of course it can't do because of this mucopolysaccharide covering. Here's another little picture. This is also from the Center of Biofilm Engineering at uh, Bozeman. And you can see here how a biofilm is attacked by certain, certain caustic elements. Let's pretend this is chlorhexidine now here, these little yellow dots. The little yellow dots are working really great on the planktonic bacteria, and it may be penetrating a little bit into this biofilm through this mucopolysaccharide covering. But 
when that happens, when there is danger outside in the environment, we have an extremely elevated number of gene transfers that occur within the biofilm. So whatever germ was out here that is now in here is something else again altogether, which is really a very interesting component of a biofilm. It has a different genotype. The, the microbe has a different genotype inside of the biofilm as compared to outside the biofilm. Not only does that happen, we also have a slower growth rate occurring when there is danger in the, uh, in the environment. We also have down here these persisters, these bacteria that act as seeds over uh, when, once, the, uh, once the danger is passed. So if you remember how, let's say, an antibiotic works, it works mainly on the, the uh, DNA replication within the cell. And if we have a slow growth rate or we have gene transfer, we have less of a chance of addressing even those bacteria if it were to get into the biofilm. Not only that, we have dormancy and the persisters down at the bottom who don't react at all. So the, so the antibiotics won't work on them at all. Kosterton found, uh, he's like the father of biofilm research, and what he discovered is the oral biofilm, and that's why it is being studied so much more. It's so much easier to get to. Um, chronic wounds and most chronic infections continue to evade solid scientific explanation. He also found that chronic human infections, including chronic wounds, constitute 80% of all human infective diseases. I'd like for you to keep that in your mind right now. 80% uh, and chronic wounds. Walcott is a physician working in Texas right now. He has a chronic wound clinic. And he is addressing these chronic wounds in a totally different way. He's found that biofilm actually inhibits the tissue healing. It's not just that it takes up the space. And the inhabitants of the biofilm express different phenotypes to fill the need, to fill any need in the colony. He also is very distressed, like um, a lot of people are, with the number of limb amputations that he has to pr produce. In a chronic wound clinic, if you can't get the chronic wound under control, you have to remove the area. And usually, if that area is on a digit like a toe or a foot, you have to remove that. And I know that this is kind of old data here from 1996, but the numbers are still increasing. So let's talk a little bit about the oral environment. We're going to come back to all of that and bring it all back around to... Um, to uh, where it all makes sense in just a second. We have to remember that oral disease is classified as an infection. An infection, it means that you can transfer that bacteria or that disease from one person to another. But we also have to remember that there are over 500 different bacterial strains. Some people say even 700. Xylitol affects, right now, the strep types. Mutans, strep pneumonia, strep zebrinus, each of them have their own little associations with different problems. Xylitol also has some effect on Haemophilus influenza and Candida albicans. How do we know that strep mutans causes cavities? Well, I had to go back and rethink this because recently at the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry, Dr. Cooch stood in front of the audience and said, after Dr. Marsh's talk in 2008, he kind of rethought his whole, his whole perspective on caries management and how we talk about it as being a bacterial infection. And he's come to the conclusion that maybe it isn't so much about the bacteria as it is about the pH. And really, the dissolution of enamel, I would agree with that, is a chemical reaction, is a pH issue. But when we go back 
to our original studies in the 1960s, we are uh, where we found that strep was the issue. This is how that kind of mapped out. We found that if we had notobiotic rats that are that means rats that are bred to be without any bacteria at all, none. They have no germs associated with them at all. And we inoculated half of that group with strep mutans. And we fed them a diet of 5% sucrose. Within a short amount of time, we would have a lot of cavities, a lot of lesions in the teeth of those rats. And it progressed quickly. It doubled over the next 10 days. So we have a big problem and we can pretty much associate it then with strep mutans. The, on, the, on the flip side though, we had those notobiotic rot, rats that were not inoculated with strep fed the same diet of sucrose and we found no lesions whatsoever. So why is it that we continually go on and on about sucrose or sugar causing cavities? It does not. Sugar does not cause cavities. You must have the bacteria as well. We have other studies that continued on to show that the strep was a major component in the cavity experience. Caries is an infection and it produces holes in teeth called cavities. If we use the same term interchangeably, as in a hole in a tooth is also called caries, we're blurring the reality. So I would like to address that also to say that a cavity is a hole in a tooth and caries is an infection that is caused by certain bacteria. However, recently we have found that people with rampant decay and early childhood caries also has a component of candida involved. We also know that we have a lot of strep and a bunch of different kinds of strep. So that's kind of where the xylitol study started. We knew that we had strep and we knew that xylitol, or we found out along the way, that xylitol affects the streptococcus bacteria. The strep cannot eat the xylitol, although it is the preferred sugar when mixed with other sugars. If you give these strep bacteria xylitol mixed with any other sugar, they'll go for the xylitol first. So because they can't metabolize xylitol, they starve and they start to die. There are no acids produced. It creates a poor environment for other karyogenic bacteria and the non-karyogenic bacteria can then take over. What we also found recently is that we have an inoculation period of strep mutans. We used to say that the window of infectivity was about 26 months of age. We found recently that that has been lowered now to about 16 months of age. In his studies, Moen found 20% of the 14-month-old children were already inoculated or infected with strep mutans. And Milgram found that predentate six-month-old children did not have or were already colonized with strep. We always thought that strep needed a non-sloughing surface in order to work, but Juan and Milgram found that that's not necessarily true. This is a pacifier with strep growing on it. Woohoo! In the study that Juan did, he took, I don't know if he's a he or a she, I'm sorry, I don't know everything. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's really hard to believe. Okay, so anyway, he took, he or she, took 111 infants, and he found that the mean age of colonization was 15 months. He also found that at 24 months, 9% of the children who were colonized already had lesions. And none of the children who were uncolonized had lesions. So 10% of all of, the, all of the children who were colonized already had lesions of some kind. So I'm thinking that 15 months of age is the perfect time to start doing bacterial colonization counts on children. That sounds incredible. I know it sounds impossible, but this is, this is why we have to keep on top of the products that are out there also. 
The uh, carry free system is just a swab of the lower anterior teeth. You put it into a little reader and then you know what you've got. Now you can start making some changes within, within the family so that the child will never get a cavity. There is no reason at all anymore to wait for a hole to develop or even a white spot lesion. This is uh, the, the con from the conclusion that Juan did in his 2003 study. The non-colonization of strep mutans was associated with parent-assisted brushing and multiple courses of antibiotics. The reason the children were taking multiple courses of antibiotics is because of their ear infection. So if you think this through for a minute, you have the eustachian, eustachian tube in a small child and they're laying down the majority of time. That eustachian tube is horizontal with the plane of the bed <laughs> and saliva will go easily between the ear through the eustachian tube and the mouth. So that's where we're getting all this bacteria and that's where we're getting this association between caries and ear infections and xylitol curing, more or less, ear infections and um, cavities. So with this whole notobiotic model in mind, we have another study here that showed that giving mothers the back, uh, mother's xylitol gum and affecting their children. The children's, I'm sorry, the mother started chewing the xylitol gum once the children were about six months old. And then they stopped using xylitol when the children were two years old. So the intervention lasted 18 months. The control was the mother's receiving fluoride varnish quarterly during that 18 month period. And the secondary intervention was the mother's receiving a chlorhexidine varnish. And look at the difference here. At two years of age, only 10% of those children were colonized. In this strep, in this, compared this to the uh, chlorhexidine varnish group and compare that to the fluoride varnish group. That's a huge, huge difference. The karyogenic bacteria create an environment that is beneficial to other karyogenic bacteria once they're entered into that biofilm. They have a lower pH, there's the pH equation, and then once that pH is decreased, we have an environment where the basophilic bacteria cannot survive, which shifts the equilibrium, and really to be more accurate, it shifts the homeostasis. It disallows homeostasis to have this lowered pH. So every now and then I get a question about xylitol and if we're altering the flora in, of the mouth, what are the unforeseen consequences of that? And really what we're, we're doing is we're not shifting the flora to anything but health. It's more, it's more homeostatic. We have studies to show that xylitol is effective against mutans, sabrinus, aureus, pneumonia. We have xylitol studies to show its effects against caries, against yeast infections, against pneumonia, against skin issues bone health, and wound healing. Strep pneumonia, here we think strep uh, mutans is a problem. Strep pneumonia is a bigger problem. It causes a wide variety of issues, including endocarditis and cellulitis and brain abscesses and a whole big bunch of other things. We have uh, strep, uh, sorry, strep, uh, strep pneumonia is together with H influenza to cause pneumonia. And in pneumonia, we have strep pneumonia taking over the H influenza. So if you have the mixed infection, we have more strep pneumonia than influenza when there's pneumonia, the classic lung pneumonia. If you have a mixed infection, which they're all mixed infections, in um, the sinuses, we have H. influenza um, taking over. We have the ear infections. This was a landmark study done in the late 1990s with uh, 857 children, and they divided the children into groups, and each group received a different kind of xylitol or a control of that similar thing. So some xylitol gum and some not 
xylitol gum and xylitol syrup and not xylitol syrup. So they divided these children up into groups that were reflective of their ability to chew gum or not. So the younger children received the syrup. The uh, children from one and a half up were getting the gum and then lozenges or lozenges, sorry. Here we go. 68 children on the control syrup at, got at least one ear infection and 46 getting the xylitol syrup, only 29. So that's quite a bit of a decrease. It's 30% decrease. Xylitol was affecting that strep that caused the ear infection. The, uh, the high-risk children who had tubes did not seem to benefit as much from xylitol when they kind of redid the study in 2000. Candida is also affected because it doesn't allow the yeast to adhere to the tissue. It can't attach in the presence of xylitol. That is a key thing that we're going to find in just a second here. All of this relies on the specific plaque theory that one germ causes one problem, that there is one germ or one bacteria or one virus or whatever inside of that plaque. So when we look at somebody's teeth with a bunch of plaque on it, we always say, oh, that's strep mutans. Well, it's not. It's a biofilm that contains a bunch of different things. All of this kind of revolves around Cox postulate, which, which stated pretty much one germ, one disease. What you had to do with Cox postulate was isolate a particular bacteria or virus in a person with the disease, grow out that bacteria, give it to the second host, and if the second host came down with that disease, then you knew that that germ caused that disease. But what we know with caries management is that we have strep in the enamel portion in early decay. We have lactobacillus that goes into the decay where it's, when it's deep, when it gets that mushy part through the enamel. And we have uh, lactobacillus also associated with root lesions. And in early childhood caries and rampant decay, we also have a candida component. So why do we have less bacteria or less decay when we've got xylitol in the equation? That was brought to a head with this study here where 90% uh, of the subjects in this study, in this geriatric study, chose the candies over the gum, and we know that the gum is a better option than the candies, and they had a choice between, well, they didn't have a choice, they were assigned either a xylitol gum, or sorbitol gum, or a control gum, using up to 10 grams a day. And even though we were looking at root decay, which is associated com almost completely with lactobacillus, we still had much less root decay, actually no root decay, in the xylitol group. So now we're all sitting back here scratching our heads going, okay, it doesn't work against lactobacillus, but what's, what's going on here? What we have to remember is that any of this is not an isolated bacteria. It's a mixed soup. A biofilm is mixed up with all of these other components. What happens with xylitol is it disallows the biofilm to be a biofilm. In order for a biofilm to produce that mucopolysaccharide protection that it's covered, that covers it, we have to have sucrose. Sucrose is the component that makes that, that, uh, that sticky part. When xylitol is in there, xylitol trumps any other sugar. So now none of that bacteria can create that mucopolysaccharide. So when there's xylitol in the equation, the biofilm is less and less and less. When there's less bacteria, you have less of everything. You have less decay, less pneumonia. Yes, there are xylitol resistant bacteria. I am not kidding. Uh, this is what happens. There was a study that showed that there were viable strep after the uh, after xylitol was presented to the strep. 
The difference was that none of that strep was able to adhere to the tissue. It was planktonic all the time. Adhesion is critical. If you don't have the adhesion component, you will not have disease. You won't have the biofilm production. We have a number of ways of addressing the adhesion of these bacteria so that they can't cause a problem. Xylitol is a huge one and it's very easy to use and compliance is pretty high. Cranberry juice is another. We have to shift our thinking to something a little bit different. We always talk about brushing and flossing and the mechanical plaque removal and that is a means to an end, but the end product really is biofilm reduction. It's not necessarily the, um, it's not just breaking up the biofilm with a toothbrush or floss. We can address the biofilm reduction in a number of other ways. Remember that 65% of diseases are biofilm infections, including caries, including, well, see there I did it again. I still make the same mistake. I went to school in the 80s. This should be lesions, periodontal disease, uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis, sinusitis, lesionnaires disease. We have a number of studies to show uh, the cranberry effect on the adhesion properties of different bacteria. For some reason, when we're using cranberry juice, we don't even need to go we don't even have to have the cranberry juice touching the bacteria or touching any part of the biofilm or any component in the biofilm. Uh, we have studies to show that cranberry juice will affect the adhesion of the bacteria in the bladder. So we have pretty far reaching effects of this cranberry juice. It has, uh, well, here we go again, just dis desorption from the artificial biofilm, influenza virus adhesion, it's uh, on and on and on. Xylitol has been, we're trying to kind of soup up the bio, uh, excuse me, the xylitol, and by adding it to different components to see what happens. When we add xylitol to Zorbitol or back and forth, we don't really get any kind of a synergistic um, result. When we put xylitol together with Rithritol, which is another polyol, we have some, some synergy there. This study here showed um, the synergy on strep. We have a, uh, a couple of studies to show erythritol with respect to xylitol in bone resorption. It decreases the bone resorption and increases the bone building. So that might be one of the other things that we're going to be looking at when we talk about uh, sorry, osteoporosis. Xylitol inhibits inflammatory cytokine expression. Perio. Very little research on perio with respect to xylitol because we keep looking at the specific bacteria. And we know that xylitol doesn't affect those particular bacteria. However, if we're not getting adhesion and we're not getting a biofilm production, yahoo, we're making big strides. This is a really good example. This study down here to show that we have to stop thinking about the brushing and flossing. How many times can you, you know, screw a tennis ball onto the back of a toothbrush to get a physically disabled person to brush their teeth when it's almost impossible? So when we're employing xylitol and maybe xylitol with some of these other components with cranberry juice, let's say, we can make a huge, huge difference. What if we use cranberry juice as the only juice in a long-term care facility? We can be making all kinds of progress with that also. We have to change our thinking from brushing and flossing to biofilm reduction. Here is a study that Matilla did on uh, dietary xylitol with respect to collagen in the skin of uh, rats so far. We're finding that Collagen and xylitol go very well together, and if we remember that collagen is the major component of the periodontal fibers, we're, we're talking again about xylitol with respect to periodontal infection. Remember that Dr. Roy Page years ago in, I think it was 1990 or 2000, 
found that the surface area of the wound in a person with a moderate case of periodontal disease and 20 teeth had a wound approximately the same surface area as the palm of the human hand. Think about that for a minute. Think about the soft tissue wall of the pocket being a wound instead of being the soft tissue wall of the periodontal pocket. Let's look at this again. We always see this, this picture here or any other picture depicting a biofilm on the hard tissue wall of the pocket, and this is almost always devoid of biofilm. But now we'll take a look over here at what they're finding in the chronic wound studies with respect to biofilm and how the biofilm takes up the entire space between, of that wound. You can see that we have bloody tissue back here, down here, this is this huge biofilm that will not allow um, oxygen. We need to have oxygen in order to heal. We have white blood cells trying to get up at it. We have all of these other components that are trying to combat this biofilm, and they cannot. It's too thick. So what they've been doing in the past is they've been scratching this with a brush, or they're using ultrasonics to break up this biofilm. But what they're doing down in Texas now is they're combining a poultice. Remember the word poultice? That was big in the 70s. Everybody was doing poultices for, for their colds and their upper respiratory infections. But they're creating a poultice with xylitol and lactoferrin. Lactoferrin enters into the cell wall and disturbs the entire bacteria or the microbe that it comes in contact with. But the xylitol is creating a better environment for that lactoferrin to get through. We have 10, 100,000 times more bacteria in a periodontal pocket, and we also have increases in temperature and a, a population shift. So now let's just talk about how we can use the studies of biofilm with respect to wound care and put it now to periodontal infections, and now we can really start talking. Here it was again, three to 12 weeks later, we have the subgingival microflora building back up again, which is where we get the three-month recall from, but really, that's crazy. Why on earth would you wait that long? That's like waiting until you can't see your kitchen floor before you wash it. We need to address this earlier, maybe every six weeks. We can have our patients back, just do an ultrasonic whip through just to get those pockets cleaned up, break up those biofilms before they get a really good handle on things. Why wait until they're like a second away from being mature? Price it out accordingly. It's a 15 minute appointment, it might be $25, I don't know. But we can do so much more and this could be another income stream and a health stream for all of our patients. Antibiotics are problematic, one, because they can't get through and two, because you need to have such a high concentration in order to do anything because it has to get through into that sulcus. So this is still, the only way to do this is to use a locally delivered antibiotic. I just, I'm not all the way through this whole idea of, of um, using systemic antibiotics to get at bacteria in the pocket, even if they're planktonic. So periostat stops the body from fighting the infection with uh, keeping down the C-reactive protein numbers and some of the other markers. But Atrodox and Arrestin and that, they have the ability of having high concentration right in the pocket, right where the biofilm is. So now let's think of this biofilm as being the soft tissue wall of the pocket. And here's the hard tissue wall of the pocket. And now just think of the synergy of what's happening here between the two biofilms. Just think of how much more chemicals there are, how many more chemicals there are in here, and how much more activity there's going on in here than we ever, ever thought. Not just of individual germs or virus. We have this entire biofilm to worry about. Ultrasonics, we've been using them for a long time. Not everyone is using them to their fullest ability or fullest um, capability. 
We use ultrasonics in water to reduce algae. It increases healing and chronic wounds by seven, up to 75%, mostly because it's oxygenating. And um, in, silo, in, sorry, in uh, periodontal treatment, we have the ability to, to break up the colonies, to break up the biofilm, and not only that, using ultrasonic energy will potentiate whatever ingredient we add to the lavage. So what a lot of people are doing is they're using chlorhexidine, but they're only adding as much as they feel like it. It's never a measured amount. We're using povidone iodine with extremely good results, except it's a big pig mess. What if we started using xylitol in that lavage? And really, just think of how happy our patients are going to be. Yay, I get to have the sugar wash. So by using xylitol and using ultrasonics together, we are in very good hands. There are at least 46 different combinations of periodontal pathogens and 10, 10 different antibiotic regimens that we may have to use to target the bacteria. But again, we're targeting all of these planktonic bacteria and it, they only act on the rapidly replicating bacteria. So it's still, we still need to do something with the biofilm. Remember how this whole thing works where, you know, the, the antibiotics may penetrate through here and they may even penetrate up to here into the mucopolysaccharide covering, but we have these persisters that are still down here. Lactoferrin sequesters the iron needed for the bacteria to survive, so it interferes with the way the bacteria live. Yay! It bonds to the lipopolysaccharide on the cell's outer membrane, so it can't keep pumping it out and it this is a, this is a cool word rigidification i think i said it right and everything rigidification it, which releases the uh which is a part of the cell wall that releases that polysaccharide and in and leads to cell death actinomycin has also been shown to stop um, the quorum sensing uh, garlic extract and an increased pH. We have a number of products now that will help us increase our pH and to last longer. Mi paste for one, um, Novamin for another, Xylitol for another. I did a study recently. <laughs> I guess you can't really call it a study. I was doing a hands-on class where we were using the GC um, saliva check to test everybody's saliva. I had 30 people in the audience and I took two people out after they had finished testing their, their saliva by chewing on that little paraffin thing, I had them then chew on a piece of xylitol gum, and the increase in pH was really substantial. It was like four or five up to nine, eight, sorry, eight. So we have these attachment inhibitors that we could be using, xylitol, cranberry, licorice root. We've heard, we heard a lot about that at the beginning of the year, and it's kind of faded away. But that's still a viable player here, lactoferrin. Xylitol is a uh, sugar alcohol, a polyol. Polyol, y'all. They, uh, inc they are incompletely absorbed in the body and contribute to fewer calories. They act in the lower intestine much like a, uh, a fiber does. So we have this longer lasting satiety kind of a thing, which is helpful in dieting. The calories is less, although it measures one-to-one -one with sugar. We have, as I mentioned, xylitol studies that cover all different kinds of categories here, not just caries management. It's sweet. It comes from plants. It is FDA-approved food additive like salt and pepper. There is no insulin produced when you're using xylitol, which is great for our diabetic patients unless they're having what is commonly called an insulin reaction where they have too much insulin and they need sugar for the insulin to act on. Don't give them xylitol anything because it won't help. What you need to have in your office is a disc. It's like a sweet tart, but it's a measured amount of sugar, and a diabetic needs to have a measured amount so that they can do their math um, using the... the uh, little tube of uh, cake frosting really is not what you want to use. There are special 
cheap ways of having sugar on hand for your diabetic patients. In Europe, they're using xylitol in their IV nutrition bags instead of uh, glucose. We do not do that here. Um, there have been too many deaths for the uh, feds to allow xylitol to be used that way. We are rapidly encroaching on the numbers of Tylenol deaths, and that number for xylitol in the IV bag is two right now. Two. Right. Two. Xylitol is found in nature in all different kinds of fruits, all different kinds of vegetables, including the wines and jams made from those fruits. Yahoo! Another good reason to be a wino. Woohoo! Production occurs as a natural intermediate step in carbohydrate metabolism in the human body where we can produce up to 15 grams per day. Most of it you will find in the portal vein. How much do we need? It is still yet to be determined. This study here showed benefits of xylitol as low as 1.56%. So you want to know how much. Well, we're doing it a little different. We're not talking about grams anymore. We're going to talk about servings. When we talked about grams, what people were doing is using 10 grams for breakfast or before they went to bed at night and called it good. It's not like a pill. It needs to be used topically. So we are saying between 6 to 10 servings per day. So if you brush your teeth twice with a, twice with a xylitol toothpaste in a day, that's 2. If you put, you know, a little bit in your cereal, that's three. If you have two pieces of gum, now we're up to five. So that's how we're measuring xylitol now. That's the preferred way to use it in servings. Uh, Spry has a number of, probably the widest variety, of xylitol products, including candies and mints. They also have a sprinkling sugar right here, which is the xylosweet. This is what you would make your pudding out of. This is what you would use for Jello. This is what you would use to put in your in your cup of tea. Do not make a you know a pitcher of tea and sweeten it all with xylitol and then drink the whole pitcher in a day. You will be in the bathroom. This here is a is a product that's specifically for children. It's a little um, xylitol tooth gel. It also has a component in there to help remineralize teeth. And they've also created this little pacifier where you can put that tooth gel right in the back of this pacifier and dose the child with xylitol using that pacifier. This is what xylitol looks like at work. You can see the amount of biofilm that is on the first picture. This is from uh, Drs. Meisner and Bybee in Pocatello, Idaho. This uh, says at the top here that they used chlorhexidine. That is a one-time chlorhexidine application in the office and the patient was instructed to use the xylitol gum a couple of times a day, and this is the difference after three months. The, uh, the patients were given oral hygiene instructions. You may want to write this down. Brush better. So these are the questions. This is the question that we don't have an answer to yet. Why is the body making xylitol? Is there a function other than this in the, in the body for xylitol? And how does topical xylitol affect the biofilm? When uh, I did this course the 14th or whatever day that was, last week we had Dr. Ammon as a special guest from um, University of Montana Bozeman Biofilm engineering wing there and she explained that because xylitol is perceived as a food by the biofilm it allows the xylitol in and that's how it affects the entire biofilm nation it decreases the amount of that polysaccharide that's produced and it then is not protected so once it's not protected it allows some of these other things in so it works synergistically that way so then, there we have it. I'm so glad that you attended this Sunday morning version of biofilm and or xylitol and biofilm. You can't have one with the other. I know that you're going to be practicing differently on Monday. This is Career Fusion's uh, advertisement. This uh, we're meeting again at our retreat in Daytona Beach in January. Patty and Beth and I are here today and we're working hard on putting um, the final touches to the program. 
If you'd like more information, you can email us about it. If you're tired of clinical or you want to do something else in the conjunction with your clinical, this is the answer to your shortcut question. Career Fusion has a number of corporate partners who are looking for different kinds of things. Um, GC America is looking for people to understand their products better. Spry is looking for flag waivers for xylitol. Novamin has a bunch of projects that they're working on. They're always looking for hygienists. Or Escoptic has been an incredible, incredible supporter of dental hygiene for a long, long time. Um, dental Rat is one of our new corporate partners, which is a, a mouse for your foot. So charting is no longer a problem. You don't have to break sepsis in order to use it. Atrodox, of course, is a topical locally delivered antibiotic. RDH, we all know and love. Springstone is helping us with our financing for the, uh, for the meeting. So if you need help with uh, tuition and that, you can get that through Springstone. So thank you so much. We are closing this webinar. If you have further questions, please email us. And, uh, oh, this is a trick-or-treat slide that I put together. Somebody sent that to me. I know it's really hysterical. I'm not sure which one I like the best. This one is probably the most clever, but somehow this one here really keeps dragging my attention. Um, so have a great week, week coming up, and I'm so happy to be able to provide some more information on xylitol for you. Have a great week.